Well, as I was telling some of the earlier arrivers, I am in Portland and it is already 105 degrees here and it is it is on its way to 111, 113, 115, depending on what forecast you read. Yesterday it only hit 108. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, I'm inside, I'm in air conditioning, so. Um, yeah, he's up in Seattle where it's 100 and something. I, uh, let's see, what do I do? Gosh, it's hotter than Vegas. So here, this is Courtney. <laughs> I'm gonna see her on Tuesday. <laughs> um, and this is Carl, Carl, who's talking, and who is this? I don't know her, but she's probably one of the Picks, Pickwickians. I carry my own low temperature always about with me. I ice my office in the dog days and do not thaw at one degree at Christmas. So you see there's a <laughs> yeah. quote for every <laughs> life situation. <laughs> All right, I think Hello. we'll I think we'll wait a minute or two more. Hello, Trudy. How are you doing? Oh, well, it's hot. I'm, it, I'm, it is indeed. I love the sentence you chose. I'm in Connecticut and it's not that hot. It's <laughs> only about 80. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. I think we're about 80. We're in the Bay Area in California. Well, I'm 70 in Laguna Beach. Hey, Glenna, how's it going? <laughs> My well, I'm in Tucson, it's always hot, so. Hi, Peggy. Hi, I want to come see you. I'm in a residence hotel in Sunnyvale with air conditioning. <laughs> uh, do you have a pencil? Um, Andy? Yeah, I do. Yes. Okay. Four zero eight. Uh-huh. Seven three six. Seven three eight six. All right. And I won't be available until Thursday. I'm teaching tomorrow. I'm going to see Courtney on Tuesday. Right, Courtney? That's right. And I'm and hey, Courtney, can we can we make that eleven instead of ten thirty? Of course. Great. Let's make it eleven. All right. I run a tight ship, so okay. we are going to start. And here's how it's going to work. We are not going to do introductions today. You can introduce yourself before you are asked to do your quote. So we're going to get right into things. But mm -hmm. before we do, Courtney's got some general rules, and she is now going to mute you all. Okay, uh, let's see. I am trying to help someone in the room. So um, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm going to meet you in just a moment. And um, if you have questions or would like to um, contribute a, um, a passage, please use the uh, raise hand feature. Um, I'm going to enable the live transcript. So if you um, would like uh, to, to access closed captioning, you can uh, just click on the live transcript or closed captioning uh, button in the lower uh, menu. And I think that's it for now. So I will mute everyone. Um, all right. So. Um... Welcome all to Christmas in June. And let's see, Courtney has not muted everyone yet. I uh, I'll mute everyone and then unmute you, Carl. All right. Welcome all, my name is Carl Wilson. I am a uh, a member of the Friends of the Board of the Dickens Project, have been for about five years. And I have been to seven or eight of the last 10 or 11 Dickens universes. I had to miss a few. I am sorry to say that. I am a lifelong Dickens lover. And I have under my pen name, Christopher Lord, I've written two Dickens themed mystery novels. One is about, one is called The Christmas Carol Murders. So I feel pretty comfortable with A Christmas Carol. I've read it every year for 55 years. 
And, but I have a terrible memory. So that's why I have to reread it every year. So we're gonna get started. Because many of you are gonna be spending a week analyzing and discussing a Christmas Carol at the virtual universe next month, I thought we would do something different for the Pickwick Club this month because of the special nature of this book. And because so many of us, like me, have a lifelong, if not, or years long, if not a lifelong interest and attachment to Dickens and this book in particular. For many of us, I think for me, it's true, this was my first taste of Charles Dickens. Uh, whether you read it yourself, whether you uh, see a live stage adaptation or one of the many, many, many film and television adaptations that have been made over the years, uh, rumored to be more than a hundred. Whether it's Alistair Sim, Michael Caine, Albert Finney, Bill Murray, Vanessa Williams, Kelsey Grammer, Patrick Stewart, Scrooge and his story of reclamation and redemption is tailor-made for adaptation, whether live, animated, such as Mr. Magoo, one of my personal favorites, or even performed by singing and dancing Muppets. So today I asked all of you through Courtney in a few words to bring to this discussion a, a favorite quote, which I would like you to read and describe in a few words, how the quote relates to your personal history with Dickens' story or with Dickens generally. Um, I'm going to start with my two friends in New Orleans. Um, and I'll be soliciting quotes by staves. So we're going after Megan and Maroney go with their two quotes, we are going to go from stave to stave, starting with Marley's ghost. Now, don't worry if someone else gets to your quote before you do. If you raise your hand and let Courtney know you also chose whatever, um, it's perfectly okay. You will get your chance to talk also when that quote comes up. You know, if you wish to cite a particular adaptation as the source of your emotional content with the quote, that's perfectly okay. When it comes my turn during the Ghost of Christmas Past stave, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So we only have two hours together and we have upwards of 40 people who have registered. So please, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Courtney will be the referee and she, as you know, those of you who know her is brutal. Uh, if you wish to uh, ask questions or make comments, as Courtney said, use the, the raise hand feature if you wish to solicit or you have a quote. If you have a general question for the group, you can use the chat feature and we will get to those questions if we have time and we'll call on you. And so now Courtney, please unmute Megan Kelly and Maroney Dupuy, who are both from the New Orleans chapter of the Dickens Fellowship and dear friends whom I met as many of you have met through Dickens Universe because Dickens people are nice people. So, Maroney or Megan, are you ready? Yes. Yes. I'm ready. yes. All right. <laughs> I'm Megan Kelly. I'm in Detroit right now visiting my third grandchild. But yes, I'm from New Orleans and I have three minutes to tell you a story. Maroney Dupuy and I met when working at Country Day, a Country Day school. I was lower school librarian and she was a three, four, and then fifth grade teacher. We discovered a love of Dickens and found ourselves at the Dickens universe the year they did Oliver Twist. And that was Carl's first year too. We all became friends. Back home, we decided we wanted to share our enthusiasm for the inimitable one. And we started a fifth grade Dickens club. From September through December, students would meet weekly at the library for lunch. They watched film clips of the many, many adaptations of Christmas Carol to give them context. And they listened to us read the story aloud. At the end of the book, we had a plum pudding feast and watched a full length movie version. It was a very popular program and we continued to offer it until last year when we both retired. Our initial fifth graders are now 21 years old. We always told them that there would be a final exam and it was this. 
for the rest of their lives, if anyone ever asked them what they did or what was their job, they were to answer, mankind is my business. When Scrooge tells Jacob that he was always a good man of business, Marley rejoins, business? cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. The Dickens Club in our readings and discussions formed an, oh, such an important part of the lead up to the Christmas season for me. And I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to to share my enthusiasm and my love with our students. And that's my favorite quote. Marini, I know yours is connected. Hi, um, so I'm Marini Dupuis, Carl said, also from New Orleans. And did you mention that Megan and I run the Dickens, the Dickens Fellowship of New Orleans? You probably did. I you did. did. Good, <laughs> well, I remind people again. So Megan just described the Dickens Club that we ran for fifth graders for many years at our school. As she said, over the semester, we would frequently have students practice for their final exam by asking them, what is your business? And to which they knew to reply in unison, mankind is my business, you know, in their little 10 year old voices. The sound of their young, enthusiastic voices echoes joyfully for me to this day. But I have another echo from the story that haunts me. Of course, we wanted the students to understand what it means. Somehow my reading in this room with the door closed is making two dogs bark outside the door. Anyway, I'm gonna to try to just, is it, should I do something? There's nothing to do. Okay. Of course, we wanted the students to understand what it means to have mankind be your business. And we did not shy away from the darker side of the tale. So along with the story of Tiny Tim, the, I'm going to open the door, that it will stop the barking. While we're waiting for Marini to come back, if any of you chose either of these quotes as your own, please let Courtney know now. So we'll call on you when Marini has finished. Animals, okay. So where was I? Um, so along with the story of Tiny Tim, to me, the final scene in Stave Three, in which the ghost of Christmas present um, introduces the, the two pathetic children, ignorance and want, presents the concept powerfully and strikes right to the heart of the story. Dickens's reference was to the extreme poverty among the poor in the 1840s but it resonates in our time just as strongly. So I'll read a few quotes from that section. <clears throat> from the foldings of its robe, the spirit brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. Oh man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. Scrooge started back appalled. Uh, spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man, said the spirit. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both and all of their degree, but most of all, beware this boy for on his brow, I see that which is written doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they no refuge or, or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons, said the spirit? Are there no workhouses? So the spirit's indictment of Scrooge in his own words still gives me the shivers after all these decades of reading this story. And it's just one of my favorites. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Did anyone else choose either of these quotes as their favorites? Now speak now or we will move on. 
Do you see any hands, Courtney? All right, great. So now we're going to go back to stave one, Marley's ghost. So if you have uh, chosen a quote from stave one, please let us know now. I see uh, Trudy and Blair, at least, and Ernest and David. Okay, so uh, Blair, then Ernie, then David. And I think I saw Trudy. So, uh, oh, we have two Trudys. So, uh, and Maxine. So let me write all of this down. So we'll start with Blair, then Ernie, um, David. Rudy. All right, go ahead, Blair. Thank you. Um, I'm a re <clears throat> retired professional fundraiser, and um, I'm interested in Charles Dickens' view of philanthropy. So each time I read A Christmas Carol, I especially enjoy that moment early in the story when Scrooge is solicited, because I've been there. Uh, and I'm going to read here at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge said the gentleman taking up a pen it is more than unusually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. I marveled when I read this the first time, then as now solicitations were done by peers, we still do that. I think it's very clear that Charles Dickens was solicited many, many times uh, for, for money. And then as now, the solicitors clearly practiced their lines. Uh, I can imagine that the next place they went down the street, they said the very same thing to the next prospect. Note that Scrooge feels that he's already been forced to be a philanthropist through taxation. His reaction is similar to that of the particle children from chapter eight of Bleak House, anger. Dickens clearly believed, as do I, that true generosity comes from within. And that I believe, as I'm sure most of you do, is one of the central messages of A Christmas Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Uh, David Brownell. Oh. I, I think I was next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, my, my passage is a little less, um, what I guess, meaningful. Um, and I must say, I, I used to watch a lot of the movies and uh, all the time, every Christmas, and I was getting a little tired of them and I'd never read Christmas Carol. I've read, you know, all his novels and all that stuff, but I hadn't read it until just recently. And I just realized how well written it is and how enjoyable it is just like all the other, other um, books he's read, written. And so my little passage is um, when uh, they're um, describing Scrooge's, um, where he lives and uh, his suite of rooms and, I'll just read it, but they were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house playing at hide and seek with the other houses and forgotten the way out again. And um, then I tried to, I just love the, what he does with houses sometimes and all the different things like that. But it also then I was saying, it's kind of like Scrooge, you know, he kind of, when Bell tells him the world, you fear the world too much. And, um, and then all of what's subsequent where Scrooge went, um, he kind of ran down an alley and forgot his way out. And so I guess I see that in uh, Dickens all the time. He's got even the littlest passages he relate to the theme or what he's do, trying to get across or the atmosphere. Thank you, Ernie. Of course, um, Dickens is famous for objectifying people and personifying things. And I think that's what we see there in that lovely passage. Thank you very much. Who's next? David. Okay. Uh, 
I'll read and then comment. Scrooge and his nephew. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. I choose that because it interests me at what Dickens is doing to the reader at the beginning. When you start any story, you're trying to figure out what kind of story is this. Dickens has used some of the paraphernalia of ghost stories, kind of th uh, cliche is left on the beach when the Gothic novel's tide went out. But he's making it clear by this overstatement that he's taking a comic approach to this. And the fact that Scrooge is not miserly with his words and uh, is extravagant, I think is one of your very early suggestions that maybe there's more to this man than what the narrator has said about how awful he was. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Uh, and who's after this? Uh, Trudy Bird. Hi, thank you. Um, Marley was dead to begin with which is a total contradiction because once you've said Marley is dead, it's not possible to begin. And when I was rereading Christmas Carol this time, I started noticing all the rhetorical things that Dickens does. And I think that um, Ernest and I think David also referred to certain rhetorical um, practices that Dickens uses. One of them that I noticed particularly was his um, his use of repetition or, or aggregation, um, which if you if you look at the story again, I didn't pick all those out. I'm rushed for time today. Sorry. Um, his rhetoric is incredible, and if you go back to the classic Greek rhetorical devices and try to pick those out, it adds another dimension to. Um, to the story. I also noted, and again, I can't pick out a particular passage, but I have learned that magical realism starts with South America in the 1930s, not this story is so full of magical realism that it makes my heart bleed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trudy. So my first mystery novel opens, no one was dead, colon, to begin with. And I entered this book into a contest um, with a national mystery writers contest. And I was eliminated during the first round. And when I got my, or to my surprise, when I got my feedback back, one of the uh, judges who ostensibly was supposed to know more than I did, uh, commented on my poor grammar in using a colon to set off the first sentence. And we know better than that. I don't have any bitterness about that, not really. Uh, anyone else with uh, Mar uh, a stave one quote? Trudy Huffacker, please. You're on mute, Trudy. Trudy, you're still on mute. Got me? Yes. OK, great. Great. go ahead. Um, the uh, this is when um, Marley has. Well, my background, I mean, I've I love Dickens. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Marley has just come in and and Scrooge um, doesn't. Uh, 
doesn't really want to believe that he's there. And Marley says, Marley's ghost says, why do you doubt your sentence? Uh, do, why do you doubt your senses? Uh, because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an unjust, undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a figment of an un, underdone potato. Um, there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. I, I just, I love the way Dickens piles up a series of things. I love the way he injects the humor there. Uh, and, um, and then he goes on to make a really astute observation. Uh, Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror. And um, I felt in this whole passage that in, in the whole first stave, uh, certainly up to that point, Dickens does a wonderful job of uh, conveying the terror that Scrooge feels, his double locking the door and, and going up and checking the door and uh, he, from the time he sees Marley's, the, the Marley's face on the door knocker. I just, it made me smile um, and it made me kind of uh, feel uh, the, and understand the fear that uh, Scrooge has. Thank you very much, Trudy. I think as David pointed out a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are only 30,000 words in this story. So Dickens has not a lot of space that he is, was accustomed to in his triple decker novels. Mm -hmm. So to, to, in Trudy's quote, to give in the fewest possible words, a sense of Scrooge's underlying intelligence and mm -hmm. the remains of a sense of humor that we hope to come out later um, uh, is, uh, uh, thanks for bringing that to our attention, Trudy. I see uh, Bruce has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Um, I find you and I have at least two things in common. Uh, one is that I too have read and watched at least three or four versions of the movie uh, every year for at least 55 years, maybe a couple more than that. And uh, although my favorite version is the Alistair Sim version, my second favorite is clearly Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. So um, the reading I'm choosing comes right after the one Trudy just read. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? And I could go on, but I'm going to try and stay within the 50 words you asked as a limitation. Um, You're a good soul, thank you. <laughs> I moved to the States. When I was eight years old, I'd lived in Africa before that. And I think it was very shortly after that, that I first saw the Alistair Sim Christmas Carol on television. And that scene stuck in my eight year old brain. That, and, and what I realized ever since is anytime I see a new version, I am looking and listening for that man of the worldly mind line. If it's there, it's a good version. <laughs> Mr. Magoo, notwithstanding. If it's not, it's questionable. Um, I, I'm a collector of books. I am reading a very nice fine press copy of, uh, of Christmas Carol to you. Um, and m one of my areas of specialty happens to be uh, early 20th century weird fiction and ghost stories. And it, it, every reader has to decide whether they believe what's happening is happening or it's something going on inside of the character. And just for the record, I believe 
Marley came, the ghosts were real. It's all a true story. That's all. Thank you very much. Tim, are, do you, is your quote from Mar, uh, Stave One? Tim. Tim Clark, is your quote from Stave One? All right, unmute yourself, great. Yes, yes it is. And actually, I'm gonna do a little plug here for our auction that we're going to hold on the 30th of July, the last event of our Dickens universe virtual. And this is one of the books that we're gonna have available. And it is the annotated Christmas Carol. And some of you might already have it. You might already have it and refer to it. And it is incredible. And there are a couple of things from stage one I'd like to point out. Now, I'm sure you all know why Marley's head was bound in a neckerchief from the top of his head to his jaw. Because in Victorian times, they did this to keep the mouth from dropping open when the corpse, when the corpse was out for view. And what is so ironic about this, what is a famous sketch we have of Dickens on his deathbed? Mm -hmm. The neckerchief is wrapped around his head in the same way. Now, we all know that, that Scrooge was derived from, from being a, a miser, but also it was a colloquial word for crowding or squeezing at the time. And thus his description of Scrooge as a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Also, I found out through this book that there are other variants of the word Scrooge, such as Scrooge, Scrooge, Scourge, and an old curiosity shop Kid hits a man on the head with a handkerchief of apples for scrooging his parents with unnecessary violence. So that, that is also a, a fashion that Dickens used. And then finally, uh, Marley, the name, the name that Dickens chose for this apparition, he took it from a Dr. Miles Marley who practiced near him in his lodgings on Piccadilly. And, and um, Dickens was at a St. Patrick's Day party. And one of the guests there was this Dr. Marley. And he was aware of Dickens' interest in unusual names. And he mentioned that he thought his own surname of Marley uh, was quite remarkable. And Dickens shook him by the hand and reportedly replied, your name, sir, will be a household word before the year is out. Thank you very much, Tim. Do we have anyone else with a quote from Stave One? Maxine Mac and Tiger. And Tiger. Maxine first. And you need to unmute yourself, Maxine. OK. Great. You hear me? OK. Um, they're talking about Christmas, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. <laughs> this this passage surprised me. It didn't seem Dickensian. It wasn't humorous. It was, it was like a gut check. Um, the, the commonality of people is that we're all going to die. Um, and it, it cuts through any pretensions, any difference between the rich and the poor. Um, I just felt it was a very powerful statement. Well, thank you very much, Maxine. I think like yours, like the quote that Marini read, are not necessarily deviations, but they are unvarnished moments where Dickens, the, um, the crusader and the radical comes through. So thanks for bringing that one to our attention. Tiger, please unmute yourself. Hello. Um, first of all, 
I was curious about the word stave. So I did look it up. There's lots of meanings for stave. And the one that rings, rings true for me is um, it's a part of a barrel. And it's, um, so it's part of a container. So these staves are containers for the story. Anyway, um, the quote I like is at the end of stave one, the air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. And so it's dark in London and he's looking out at a dark street and he sees um, these phantoms going to and fro and moaning. Um, this certainly um, creates a picture I don't recall, I can't recall now anything in any movie or theater that did this, that depicted this. So um, this is the first time I've read Christmas Carol and I'm very glad and I know, you know, how a book can do what a movie can't do, I love that. Um, there you go, I just love the, uh, the picture it conjures of um, the, uh, the phantoms. And I was looking through the book for the moment of transformation that uh, you want to find in every, in, every, in all literature or whatever. And uh, it's hard because I'm, I'm primed and I know that the whole thing is about transformation. But um, as we as we read this, I, I want to see if there's some I find some moment where um, he changes completely 360. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tiger. Uh, two comments. One, uh, not only does the Albert Finney musical version show the phantoms in the sky, they give a singing Alec Guinness a whole song about it and actually to my 15 year old self or 14 year old self, when I saw the movie, I actually found it quite frightening. Uh, with, with respect to your issue about transformation, I think you need to read it again because you'd, in rather than looking for a wholesale or whole scale uh, 180 degree, you need to look inside of each stave and you will find something in each stave that moves him toward a, a general uh, transformation, although certainly the scene in stay five, which I'm sure we'll be getting to in a little while, brings that a little more clearly. Thank you so much. Does yeah, I, I do hope to read it quite a lot this summer. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else with Marley's Ghost? And if not, we will move on. And- Oh, Robert. Oh, Robert, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? This is Robert yes. Gale from Denver, Colorado. Uh, this, my favorite quote is actually part of the introduction. It goes, mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Uh, and the reason I like that is that it starts off that he's approaching it with a sense of humor. Uh, and uh, that kind of sets the tone for the for the rest of the book. And it's, it's also amazing to me that, um, you know, a, a Dickens short story, I consider it a short story compared to his, his novels is more than enough material for a full length movie. So um, uh, I don't think people realize if they haven't read Dickens, how short it is compared to most of his works. But I also have a question of, uh, is there any other writing of Dickens where humans uh, converse with spirits. So I'll, 
I'll take my answer after I unmute here. Well, absolutely. And I, um, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving on. But if anyone else wishes to comment on this question, you may do so in the chat feature. Certainly, there is an interpolated tale in the Pickwick Papers uh, about a man named Gabriel Grubb, who, is, who has a little too much to, to drink one night and is visited by goblins. Um, and I was certainly going to mention this at some time during the day. If you, have, you know, if you want to read more Dickens' Christmas, I highly recommend his fifth and final Christmas novella, The Haunted Man. Some critics think it is a shallow and hollow repetition of some of the weaker themes from A Christmas Carol. I don't happen to think that. And to your specific point, it does involve another potentially, uh, potential visit by a spirit, or it may be uh, to those people who like the higher psychological explanations, more of a divided personality sort of issue. I am going to move on unless anyone else has another quote from Marley's ghost. I am going to move to the ghost of Christmas past and I'm going to share my own uh, quote. And the reason I have chosen this, and I'm going to show you a moment from the Albert Finney version of Scrooge starring Dame Edith Evans and Albert Finney. And no matter what adaptation, um, back to the earlier point, I think it was Bruce who made it that you you have a litmus test for if a quote is, if a line is in an adaptation, it's either good or if it's missing, it's, it's dismissible. This is one of those moments that I have. And so here we go. It's about 30 seconds. Let's see if I do this right. Let us look at another Christmas. Abby. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home with you, Fab. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He sent me in a coach to bring you home, Ebby. We're to be together all Christmas long. Go and fetch your things. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. She had, I'll not deny it. She died a woman, and I believe had children. One child. Your nephew. Yes. She was always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. I'm not sure that Dickens wrote a finer sentence than that in his entire career. And if that doesn't bring a tear to your eye, then you don't deserve the Lord's bright blessing from the Mr. Magoo Carol. Uh, that is my moment. Who else has quotes to share from stave to the ghost of Christmas past? Raise your hand now. I see Karen Kleeman for sure. Courtney, anybody else? We'll start with Karen. Uh, Karen Kleeman, please. There you go, Karen. Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, my my quote comes early in stave two when Scrooge is taken back to where he was a boy. And this is Dickens anticipating walking through the past, very, very pre-Freud. Um, we see a solitary child neglected by his friends. We enter this very cold, vast, dreary house, a melancholy room, and they see a lonely boy reading near a feeble fire. And I quote, not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the paneling, not a drip from the half thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence and gave a freer passage to his tears. And this to me is where Scrooge really starts to open up and feel his feelings. Not only is this the most beautiful description, Dickens language, but it shows so much of the psychology of being able to touch the past, making change in the present, 
the future can be different. Memory brings reconnection and renewal. Um, we can't change the past. With change, we can affect the present and the future. And that to me is the true essence of the Christmas Carol. What a, what a lovely choice. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's Barry, Pearl, Barry Pearlstein. I had the same quote as Karen, so I'll just expound. <laughs> Brilliant choice, and you and you read it better than I would. Uh, Barry Pearlstein, I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm new to Dickens. I really appreciate this group. I did Dombey and Son with the group. That was the first thing I did uh, with you all, so I really appreciate it. It's been, been great kind of get through the pandemic to explore this. So um, I just think the, the few Dickens I've read, I just think how he handles childhood and especially looking back on childhood is incredible. And he captures the sort of melancholy feeling of, of uh, childhood through that quote that Karen read. So that, that's why I picked that one. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Peter Lawrence. Hello. Hello. Okay, there we go. Yes. Following from the last two speakers, I'm very close to that. The one I chose was, the school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. Uh, to me, that's beautiful. It's evocative. Uh, many of us may well be teachers and probably have seen this as we were preparing for our own Christmas holidays knowing that someone in front of us did not have a home to go to or would be left alone. Uh, I just think it's a powerful, powerful piece of writing. Uh, and that's my two previous people who've spoken uh, were very articulate as well. So we're on the same lane. So wonderful. Thank you. Oh, and I'm coming from Toronto, Canada. So hello to you all. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. I see, Tim, you have your hand raised. Do you have a second passage? Or do you have a brief comment? Oh, oh you know me. I've got stuff for every state. I, I, I know you do, but I, I am a little mindful of our time. I can just put stuff in the chat. I'll just put stuff in the chat. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Do we have any other people with uh, quotes to, or items to share from the ghost of Christmas past? Well, that's, that's like a, a wasteland. Um, all right, let's go to stave three, the ghost of Christmas present. I see, oh, hands are starting. Let's, uh, let's start with Glenna and then move on to others who have chosen. Glenna. Uh, well, I want to say I started reading Dickens, as I've shared many times when I was 10 or 11, we read Pickwick Papers out loud. I was in a community playhouse performance of A Christmas Carol when I was uh, in middle school. And I've seen it countless times and I've read and reread all the novels, but this was the first time I'd, I, I thought I'd read A Christmas Carol, I hadn't. And it was a revelation to me. I told my daughter, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what struck me was the narrative voice is really, different than the narrative voice and so many other of the works I love. Um, oh, it was just, it was so glorious. I didn't think I could, at this stage of my life, have an undiscovered um, piece of writing by Dickens. But what I wanted to well, share- Well, Glenna, it's not exactly undiscovered. By me. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, this is it. It was so familiar on one hand, but the actual narrative voice actual writing was unfamiliar to me and that was quite a remarkable discovery um and because i was the ghost of christmas present as a kid i want to share from the ghost of christmas present there are some upon this earth of yours returned the spirit who lay claim to know us and who do their deeds of passion pride ill will hatred envy bigotry and selfishness in our name who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Well, as so often happens when I'm reading Dickens, 
I feel like, oh my gosh, you wrote this for us today. I mean, it just seems so, so incredibly on point for, you know, various examples of public hypocrisy that we all confront. Thank you. Thank you, Glenna. Uh, Melody Allen, please. You're muted, Melanie. Please unmute yourself. There you go. I told myself I wouldn't on I wouldn't start talking <laughs> <laughs> without unmuting myself, and I blew it. Um, I'm a I'm in Tucson. It's 104. If anybody is interested, it's always 104 in June in Tucson, though. Um, I'm a retired high school English teacher. And we, well, writing teachers always tell their students when you're writing description, you have to appeal to the five senses. You have to, you know, do sight, sound, taste, and so on. So when students start writing, they write things like, I saw the blue sky, I could feel the wind, the warmth of the wind, and hear the wind. I could smell the ripe peaches on the trees and wondered what they tasted like. And no, that's not quite what you're, you're hoping they will come up with. So in when the ghost of Christmas present takes Dickens to the little town, to the, to the neighborhood where the weather is horrible and cold, but the people are full of warmth and good cheer, and the little shops are, are still open. And he has, a, oh, a, maybe a page, a page and a half of description of the, the little stores and, and the goods in the stores. And he does something you tell students to never do. He starts a group of sentences with there were, and then describes, there were, and then describes. But I, I just noticed that. <laughs> but. I have, I, I'm not going to read you all the there were sentences because it's over 50 words. I'll just read a few of them because the descriptions are so vivid and real. And he not only takes Scrooge into this neighborhood, he takes the reader into the neighborhood. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle deep through withered leaves. That puts you there and it's so nostalgic. You know, remember when you used to walk through the woods and you could hear the, 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 the leaves and feel them uh, on the ground as you walk through them. And another favorite part, there were great round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. Just beautiful, beautiful descriptions. And um, that's what I wanted to share. But, but one little thing, at the beginning of that section, Scrooge is already changing because he says to the, the ghost of Christmas present, I saw some things last night show me some more so I can learn or something like that. So he's already coming along. I'm so glad you called attention to this section. Just earlier today, I was doing some online research about one of my favorite clauses in that long paragraph, which follows almost immediately on the section that you brought up. There were Norfolk Biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. Yeah. Well, what, you might ask, is a Norfolk Biffin? I remember reading this when I was a child, and not until I got the second plug, Tim, the annotated Christmas Carol, <laughs> available now in its second edition, I have them both, I found out that a Norfolk Biffin was as you might be, not be surprised, a variety of apple. Mm -hmm. But the internet age is now upon us and I know even more about Norfolk Biffins. Apparently they are so judged for their sweetness that they are often dried and flattened like cakes. 
And so the term compactness is a word that I could not have understood until I read that they are in fact flattened and were sold dried and served often with uh, after dessert by being peeled and then dipped in sugar or in um, so, or, or sugar syrup or something. So with Dickens, more is more. And I'm really pleased and happy that Melody chose something from that section. <laughs> Does anyone have any other uh, comments or, or excerpts from the Ghost of Christmas Past? I see that I'm being uh, stalked by my skylights. I may have to uh, switch my, my setup here in just a second. I will do that. It's now 106 in Portland. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much again, Melody. So if we have no more from the Ghost of Christmas present, we will move to the uh, Ghost of Christmas yet to come. And then we're gonna open it up for more general comments. Uh, who has uh, something from stay four? I see no hands. That's amazing. There are 40 of you. Are some of you being shy? There are too many of you for me to call on you by name, but I would do that if we were in a room together. And Dan. Well, let me see. Is there anything that I love from, well, I, I, there is actually, um, I'm going to, to read just something quickly because Again, back to, to Bruce's comment, um, when you watch a Dickens adaptation and you've read it as often as I do, you are looking for touchstones. You are looking for moments uh, that just make you shiver or make you laugh or whatever caused you to connect with the story in the beginning. And, and at the very end of stay four, when Scrooge is, is kneeling at the, at the foot of his own grave. And to your point, Tiger, I mean, here's the moment where you see the full evidence of the transformation. Scrooge says, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing for, on this stone. If the adaptation doesn't include the, the verb sponge, I am just not there for it. It's so magical. It's so Dickensian. It's so graphically and beautiful that I just, Bruce is smiling. I just, I have like 10 or 15 of those and I'll bet you do too. Um, so we'll keep moving on to stay five, the end of it. No, I'm sorry, we have Dan Stewart. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry, I couldn't find the reactions button to raise my hand, but I do have a quote here from um, stay four. It's the churchyard quote. The churchyard here, then the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite, a worthy place. And he has an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. And it's another kind of instance in Dickens where there's a cemetery that's um, not really, not a very good place to be and not a very sacred space, but that Dickens uses in the course of the story and in the narrative to really give attention to um, the buried dead uh, in a way that, that, is, that is a little bit um, you know, it kind of makes it, 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 it kind of looks down on, on, especially urban burial grounds where he kind of looks down on the way that the corpses are kind of rotting and putrefactions kind of rising up from the graves. And it is one instance in this novel, as in so many other novels, that he uses that. And it's right before this sort of cathartic moment that uh, Scrooge uh, confronts his own, you know, his own, his own uh, grave and his own grave site. And it is, for me, really one of the um, passages in this novel that resonates, as well as so many others um, that people have mentioned. Thank you so much, Dan. 
any other comments on, uh, I mean, I have another one of those moments and it's, it's um, five words. The color hurts my eyes. I can't think of a more economical way to take you into the tragedy of the Cratchit family. And maybe for us as 21st century people, we don't know what she's doing, but she is sewing her funeral black. And again, if that, if that sentence isn't in the adaptation, out with it. It's not, not, not a worthy Dickensian who, made, who made, wrote that script. Well, let's move on to stage, uh, stage five, the ending. Uh, who has quotes from the final bit? I am fascinated that no one has chosen anything about the Cratchits at all to, to this point, but we will come back to them in, when we get to a more general discussion of the book, the story. Who has a quote from Stay Five? Goodness, there's no one. What are we going to do? This was something I had not anticipated. I, I think this, this story you know, has a thousand uh, great moments. And so um, I, I am a bit surprised. Um, I have one. Courtney, go, please. Okay. Uh, he went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up into the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and he did it. And a while later, when he, he enters, um, he, he announces, it's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? And what I really like about this is, um, especially in this, this time that we live in, when people call each other out for misdeeds and wrongdoings, uh, that there's some room left to, uh, for Ebenezer to change his mind and to learn from his mistakes and to atone for his past sins and, um, and to redeem himself. And I think that, um, you know, Fred and Ebenezer together model this grace and humility and forgiveness that we can all learn from. And, um, when, when he says, uh, will you let me in? That, that's the, the moment that kind of brings a tear to my eye that um, he, he's just, his heart is opened and he, he is a changed man. And um, we have so much to learn from, from both of those, those characters. That's a fabulous quote. And I think ending it where you end it is absolutely right. Again, it's about the economy of this story. Will you let me in? He knows from having seen what goes on at the nephew's house already, that he is a source of amusement almost or derision from Fred's friends. And while Fred has defended him, he just kicked him out of the office and, and with some imprecations and some unpleasant language. And it, it does signal a new openness and um, a re redemption, if you will. But there is the chance that he won't be let in. And what would happen then? Um, we're going to move into a different phase of discussion. If any, and unless someone else has another quote, uh, actual quote that they'd like to read, Bruce, I see your hand up. Where are you? Where are you? Where would you like to go? I I, I cannot believe that we will finish reading quotes from this without the ending. So if I may. You certainly may. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. 
He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of all of us. And so, as Tiny Kim observed, God bless us, everyone. Can't talk about Christmas Carol without that ending. And I did abbreviate it a little bit. Well, good choice. I, I selected part of that. Uh, you know, I did the Dickens to go Christmas uh, moment on a Christmas Carol and commented both on Fred's speech and on the ending. Uh, it's, it's such fine, fine language. And in one of a, his late letters, Dickens referred to what he called the Carol philosophy. And for years and years, I always assumed that that meant specifically the speech that uh, Fred gives to Scrooge in, uh, in stave one. But uh, after conferring briefly with John Jordan on the topic, he he let me be uh, aware of it. In fact, it was not that specific. It's a more general uh, reference. But in almost every biography or every critical book about Dickens, you will read that phrase, the Carroll philosophy, even though Dickens only apparently wrote it once. So as I said earlier in the, uh, early on in, the fr in the, our discussion, many of us first approached A Christmas Carol not through the text, but through an adaptation. Now, I was seven years old when Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol came out. And I'm pretty sure I had not, I'm sure I had not read the story myself. I might have had the Classics Illustrated comic book, but I'm pretty sure I hadn't read it myself. And so my first real uh, experience or exposure to A Christmas Carol was through Mr. Magoo's a Broadway musical adaptation. And if you haven't seen it and you are about, I'm 65. So if you're about my age and you haven't seen Mr. Magoo's A Christmas Carol, run to your computer and order a DVD from Amazon. It is brilliant. The music is by Julie Stein and Bob Merrill who wrote the lyrics and music for Funny Girl. And uh, Bob, Julie Stein wrote the music for Gypsy. And the music is magnificent. And while it is not particularly Dickensian, and some of the songs step, aside, step sideways from Dickens's actual story, um, particularly uh, the Christianizing, if you will, of the, of the Cratchit family dinner, I, I defy you to watch that and not tear up three to five times or more. So if you and, raise and your hand, I have to say the line, I'm reprehensible, I'll steal your pen and pensable is <laughs> never to be forgotten. <laughs> so just this week, while I was getting ready to do this uh, this afternoon, and I see uh, Courtney has uh, linked something, um, I came across a magnificent little YouTube video. And if if Megan or Marini has access, I see Megan's holding her grandbaby, but if Marini has access to YouTube, perhaps she will link the video that the three of us watched this week, which is an excerpt of a, a live stage concert version of Mr. Magoo's A Christmas Carol. I'll give it a shot. All right, Ooh. great. And the excerpt, unfortunately, is only four minutes long, but it contains a few of the musical highlights uh, sung by Broadway actors. It's some kind of a fundraiser that's been done more than once. Uh, I would love. I would go to New York to see a concert or a our staged performance of Magoo's A Christmas Carol. But the question I'm going to open it up to everyone now is, what was your first exposure to an adaptation, or, in the alternative, what adaptation speaks most strongly to you? Which one do you go back to again and again? I see uh, Peggy has her hand raised. Use, use the raise hand feature. We'll start with Peggy though, Waters. The, the one I like is the Patrick Stewart one. Um, and the part that really moves me is when he wakes up in the bed and he hasn't missed Christmas and he starts to laugh 
And the way he starts to laugh reminds me of the first car I had and how hard it was to get it to start. And it would sputter and sputter and sputter and you'd pull, pull on the choke and then you thought it turned over and then it didn't turn over. And I can just watch that over and over. Partly this is not because I'm just a Dickens fan. I'm also a huge Patrick Stewart fan. And what he did, he said he, he played it every year in some theater because he still hadn't eradicated all the old Scrooge out of himself. Well, that's lovely. I know that he is, I, I believe there is an actual full adaptation, but there is also um, a, ca a cassette I had at, my, at some time of him reading the, the story. Oh, really? Uh, David, well, let me, let me give but it you can time. just, you can watch it for like $2 on Amazon or YouTube or something. Megan, do you have something? Oh. Yeah, let me see if I can do this. It's kind of, I'm reaching from a distance, but let me see if I can share the screen. No, it doesn't look like I can. Sorry, um, I'll try it again. Keep going. I, 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 he's, he's showing. Huh? Well, we're, all, we're seeing part of it. It's on, showing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. You can't make it larger, Megan. I'm trying. You can't. Oh, you can't. Sorry, here it is then. He likes it. Such a lonely bitch. Where is the voice to answer mine back? Where were two shoes that clicked to my clack? I'm all alone in the world. Winter was warm. Summer soft that year, the winter was warm. And it goes on for several more minutes. Um, but if you like, if you like Mr. Magoo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, let's see, uh, David Brownell. I can't resist mentioning an offshoot. I don't know how many of you remember Walt Disney Comics. Uh, there was an interesting man, an autodidact named Carl Barks. And for the, for the Walt Disney Comics, uh, he scripted and illustrated uh, a number of adventures involving Donald Duck. And he, for that purpose, invented Donald Duck's rich uncle, Scrooge McDuck, and who was a fine, fine character. Uh, he has a large bin full of money. And he says, I like to dive in it like a porpoise. I like to wallow in it. And I like to throw it up and hit me on the head. Uh, Mr. Barks financed his retirement by making and selling oil paintings of ducks. Somebody else's turn. Thank you, David. I'm glad to know that your PhD hasn't gone to waste. So, um, 
Mel Melody has had her hand up for oh, quite some time. I'm sorry, Melody. Well, actually, my hand was up to read something from stave five, so it's well, okay. Let's, well, let's well uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and do that then, and then we'll go back to the adaptations. Oh, okay. Um, it's from where Scrooge first wakes up in the morning and realizes he's not dead. And he's so, he's so happy, of course. And this is the quote, really, well, he's laughing a lot, really. For a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. And when you read that, a long, long line of brilliant laughs, you know, that Scrooge really has changed. And it sets up that ending where he becomes the wonderful, kind person that he has become now. I just love that, that sentence. Thank you, Melody. Uh, Blair. Unmute, good. Uh, in 1971, the winter of 1971, I was a college student and took some time off. I was hitchhiking through southern Spain and I found myself on Christmas Eve in a small town. I didn't know anybody. My high school Spanish was just good enough to get by. It was Christmas. They were not doing Christmas the way we do Christmas. It was more like Halloween. I wanted to do something that would bring Christmas to me, and the musical Scrooge was showing at the local movie theater, all dubbed in Spanish except for the <laughs> musical parts. But I went to see it, and that was the first time I saw that adaptation, of course, because it was brand new, newly released. And for me, it brought Christmas to me, a, a kind of lonely college student. That's my story. Thank you. I know that there are some among us who do not like the Albert Finney musical. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's see, we'll do Bruce Cotter and then Trudy Bird. You know, there are so many good adaptations. Um, I've already talked about Alistair Sim, Mr. Magoo. I do love the, the, uh, the Albert Finney musical version. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, years and years, I used to watch the Muppet one with my kids every Christmas. Um, but commenting on Peggy's note about um, Patrick Stewart, a few years back, um, 20 years back, I was the president of Shakespeare Santa Cruz, and I had the opportunity, we had the opportunity to produce uh, Patrick Stewart doing a Christmas Carol live on stage. Um, and that is one of the most memorable stage events I have ever seen in my life. Um, he started on a completely bare stage, him, the stage, and a stack of props that was about 15 feet tall. And he did the entire show grabbing one prop at a time, a chair, a table, a wrap, whatever. And he did the entire production. And as good as the movie is, um, I am telling you that was absolutely a phenomenal thing to see. I would wish that was recorded somewhere so that everyone could see it because it was unbelievable. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Trudy Bird. Bruce, I wish that had been recorded. That would be wonderful to see. Um, my first adaptation memory is from a I think it was a 78 record recording of, that's how old I am, um, of A Christmas Carol. And I can remember still some of the words uh, that came through and Marley was dead to begin with is one of them. And I think the other is the boy at the very end saying, what, the one as big as May? <laughs> Another uh, one of those lines. Yes, that's another one yes. of those test lines. Has to be in the adaptation or it's no good. <laughs> um, and I think the adaptation, the Alistair Sims adaptation, I, I don't remember the other one in which you mentioned the laugh with which he wakes up, but Alistair Sims' laugh 
when he wakes up and finds himself transformed, I think is one of the most beautiful bits of acting I've ever seen in my life on film. I love it. And I believe he says, I am as giddy as a drunken man, uh, verbatim from the text. Another one of those magical lines. Uh, Megan and then Glenna. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, while we're the George C. Scott adaptation, when I think of the Mankind is My Business line, which is what I liked so much, Frank Finley did it and he did it brilliantly. Um, there's lots in that adaptation to like and dislike, but that one little piece and bit was wonderful. I agree that Alistair Stim Sims is Sim is the Sim is the the only one in some ways although the whole show when it goes off to some of the so non-dickens stuff gets a little odd but um in our dickens club we ended up with what marini 30 adaptations we've got them all so if you're if you're ever interested just call me uh thanks very much um i know that very few are fans of the um Robert Zemeckis, Jim Carrey adaptation. But somebody earlier mentioned um, The Schoolhouse. There is something done in that Robert Zemeckis adaptation that I have never seen done in any other adaptation. And that is in the scene where the narrator describes the wood paneling rotting and changing as the schoolhouse ages before the narrator's very eyes as the scene shifts from one of the schoolhouse to the one that I used where Fan comes home. And in the Zemeckis uh, motion capture, I forget, there's another technical term for what he did, the animation above live action. He actually animates that beautiful moment from the, script, from the original text of the aging of the, um, the wood. Now he does a lot of other crazy things like the skyrocket and the, the, the 3D horses racing in, in the street, but he got that moment right. Uh, Glenna. Yes, well, um, I have to talk about the, the uh, version that I was in as a kid. Um, the passage that I remember most vividly is the passage that Trudy Hoffacker read about the undigested beef and the bit of cheese. I, for whatever reason, I just remember that um, so vividly. The other thing I have to say is my dad was in the same production and um, he was always, he always had trouble memorizing his lines. So I always, when I, whenever he was in a play, and it wasn't that many, but I always felt duty bound to learn his lines as well as mine in case he needed prompting. Uh, and then finally, and this was really memorable, it was staged as, you know, when it was the ghost showing Scrooge something, then it was like a play within a play. And so you have the curtains on the proscenium and then you'd have curtains open within. And um, this one time during the performance, instead of closing the curtains on the inner one, the stage hand, whoever this person was, obviously not a professional, pulled them open so that you saw everybody backstage <laughs> in an unguarded moment since they weren't expecting to be <laughs> suddenly uh, disclosed. So it was a memorable experience for a kid. It was the first time I had, as a kid, been in a play with adults. And um, yeah, um, and I, I remember many adaptations, but that one is hard to um, hard to erase from my memory. Thank you, Glenna. I know we have some educators with us in the group today. I'm going to call on Wayne specifically first, but if any of you are educators and have taught A Christmas Carol at any time in your career, I'd be interested in hearing uh, whether your approach to teaching has changed over the years. We've heard from Marini and Megan so far. Wayne, I know you taught Great Expectations. Did you ever teach this? No, I didn't. I taught The Tale of Two Cities for 30 years. And my greatest innovation was to teach it in the original serial form. But uh, I'm not sure how well it went over, but 
uh, several generations of, of students read A Tale of Two Cities in the, the same weekly format in which it was published. But a, uh, a Christmas Carol is taught in our seventh grade in the school where I taught. So they get a Christmas Carol early along. That's good to know. Trudy Bird, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I taught a short um, winter session course at the University of Connecticut. I taught there for 17 years. Uh, and I believe I taught A Christmas Carol as a short story. Um, I don't have much memory of it, but I have also taught A Tale of Two Cities in a, a British fiction course. I find students less enchanted than I would wish with Dickens. And I think that may be a flaw in my teaching uh, or it may be a change in taste, but I, I'm troubled that young people don't seem to understand and appreciate. And it, it looks like many of us have some, uh, some years behind us. And, and I find that's very, 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 very sad. I've wondered that uh, issue myself. Uh, I turned off the Guy Pierce adaptation after about 30 minutes. I could not stand it. Uh, it, was, it wasn't a Christmas carol. It was something, but it wasn't a Christmas carol. And, and I have not seen the end of it and I probably never will. However, if there is anyone among you who wishes to advocate for the Guy Pierce adaptation, uh, I would love to hear from you. I, Bruce is shaking his head. I'm not surprised. Um, does, is anyone enamored of the, the recent Guy Pierce three-part adaptation? I think it was on TNT television or something two years ago, maybe three. Uh, it opens with uh, someone uh, pissing on Marley's grave, if I recall. Oh. No one is raising their hands. Oh, <laughs> oh, Patricia Thorne. Yes, unmute yourself. You know, I, I'm not familiar with those adaptations, but in looking at the Christmas Carol, and I am not an educator, I'm a retired nurse. Uh, I, I um, participate with Ollie at UNLV. So um, I did a, a course with Dickens, uh, and I always want to connect uh, what he's written to what was going on in his life. And I came across an article that was in Time Magazine in 2016 that really uh, connects it all together, which you who are scholars um, are probably most familiar with. And that is uh, because of Dickens' past, uh, his youthful life when he was working in, what was it, the boot, the polisher? Warren, Warren's Blacking Factory. Yeah, the, yeah, that. So apparently that was his thinking when he was writing that and he wrote this Christmas Carol very quickly. It doesn't go to the aura of the story. Uh, it goes to the practicality of behind what he was trying to say. And, um, you know, I like to think about it that way uh, for some reason, because Christmas Carol with all of its versions, uh, seems to, I, I don't want to say it's worn out, but, um, you know, I just want to connect it to his historical moment and what he was thinking about. So there is, you can still get that time. Uh, it's a editorial, I think, and it's from 2016 by John Breutsch, December 13th of 2016. And it is the real reason Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. And I enjoyed that article so much. And I'm sorry to take you away from the, from the various versions of what had been done, uh, just to consider what Dickens was up to at the time. Well, thank you, Patricia. If Courtney can Thanks. find that, I'm sure she will link that in the chat. Uh, you know, I, I deliberately st stayed away from sort of analyzing the context and uh, environment for which I'm sure we're going to hear about that. For those of you who are attending the, uh, the virtual universe, I'm sure there's going to be a lot about that. David Brownell and then Peggy Waters. Uh, 
what Patricia was saying uh, leads me to sneak in a bit of the context. The 1840s were called the Hungry Forties. It's the decade of the Irish potato famine. And it's also uh, at the end of the decade, most of Europe broke out in revolutions. The British, as they looked at revolutions on the continent, kept feeling this could happen to us. And I think uh, the two horrible children, ignorance and want, are meant to frighten. There is this what the world is going to be run by? Thank you, David. Peggy. To comfort the person who thinks that the younger generation isn't going for Dickens, I was forced to read Great Expectations in the seventh grade, and I absolutely hated it because I thought the protagonist was a wuss and just a real jerk, and I couldn't identify with him at all. I just thought, here's a person that is a jerk. Then after I got out of college, I read almost all of Dickens to my then boyfriend. And now I can't get enough of it. Why do we only do this once a month? You know? What happened to the boyfriend, Peggy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have enough time for that. Okay. I mean, he's a famous computer guy who left me for somebody else. And it's a whole tragedy if you want to write another book. Well, on, the, you know, on that topic, I lead adult reading seminars uh, for a nonprofit here in Portland. And for those of you who have been to the universe, they are very similar to the 11 o'clock sessions that we have with the grad students, except I know a little bit more about the book than the grad students ever do. And many of the people who sign up for my seminars have that experience that Peggy is describing. They've been wounded by reading a book too soon. And Great Expectations, is one of the you know one of the great novels of disillusionment and should not be read by anyone who has never been disillusioned. They won't understand it. And I think A Christmas Carol again. I mean, I've read most of the novels. I've read all of the novels at least five times, more most of them more than ten times. And as I said, I've read A Christmas Carol fifty times. I found something in the text today I had never seen before. So each time you bring your current self to the text, you bring a different person and you will find other things. I'm leading a seminar right now on Moby Dick. And I managed to, I've managed to guide uh, 20 some people through the perils of the Pequod and everyone finished the book, which many of them thought they couldn't do. Um, but I do appreciate that, that um, you need to you know, approach Dickens on your own terms and get out of him what you can at the time that you, you read it. Um, Marini. Um, the I am an educator. I taught for 25 years. I taught young children, eight, nine, 10 and 11 year olds. But um, one of the reasons that Megan Kelly and I decided to do a Christmas Carol the way we did as an extracurricular, um, the you know class not not a class where there was a grade and um, is to address what Trudy Bird was saying is that we know so many people who read um, Dickens in middle school or high school and hated it just hated it and so what we went for I mean for example our final exam all, and we practiced the entire all you had to say was mankind is my business and you know um, and we tried to emphasize the joy of the writing of Dickens and the, the characters and the, the color that he brought to every scene and to hook them. Now, we'll see. Megan says they're 21 now. I don't know how many um, are reading Dickens. But to try to get them to love Dickens through this text so that when they approached a more complicated text when they were older, they'd be open to it and, and they'd understand better what they were getting. Peggy. 
Um, I forget who it was, somebody famous who said that what got them into Dickens, I, mean, I think I know, but don't be wrong, as a child was reading Oliver Twist. And I think that would be more appropriate for children because it's about a kid that's misunderstood and having problems. It's not about somebody with a love interest. Of course, it's also one of his worst books, in my opinion. But that's another matter for another but time. It's it's um, it's all cliffhanging, and it grabs people. It is. So I have a question for the for the general group, but particularly for those who have not spoken yet. You came here for a reason today, and the reason ostensibly is to talk about a Christmas Carol and Dickens. What have you gotten out of today's session and what haven't you gotten or what haven't you gotten yet that you would like to hear? Anyone, particularly someone who hasn't yet spoken. I will not call on you by name, even though, as I said, I am tempted to do so. Use the hand raising feature if you wish to come forward or forever remain silent. My goodness. Uh, Melody, Alan, and then Cynthia. One of the things I, I've really enjoyed about today is that the quotes people read, many of them were th things that I had jotted down. I might use that one. I might use that one. It's that you get that feeling of, oh, we all love Dickens and we're all we're all here talking about him and, and um, it's just a warm feeling to know that there's so many people who want to read Dickens and who are willing to talk a little bit about him. It's just fun. I've been enjoying myself. But isn't it shocking that no one chose there never was such a goose or they went <laughs> into the room so they could hear the pudding singing in the copper. Again, another of those magical phrases that uh, are littered throughout the text. Thanks, Melody. Cynthia. I um, hesitate to say this, but I have never appreciated A Christmas Carol very much. I have loved Dickens since I was a teenager, but I've always hated A Christmas Carol because I thought people were pushing it at me as a kind of a propaganda for Christmas. And what I have appreciated about this discussion is that it has reaffirmed what I like about Dickens, which is that he is a social reformer who writes brilliantly and that what is at the center of this book is mankind is our business and saving Tiny Tim. And I have really appreciated being kind of a fly on the wall to hear people bring that up. You obviously would have been one of the stars of Megan's and Maroney's fifth grade class then by having that appreciation. I mean, for those of you who are interested in what I would call the unique and peculiar approach to Christianity that Dickens takes, I, I would highly recommend a book called God and Charles Dickens by a, a man whose first name I think is Charles, last name College, C-O-L-L-E-D-G-E. -L -L -E. And he is a minister and he is an expert on the rewriting of the gospel that Dickens did for his children, a, a small book called The Life of Our Lord that was not published until either the 20s or the 30s. But this minister has gone very carefully through Dickens and tried to tease out of it what his actual philosophy was. And in a nutshell, he saw, he called Dickens a Jesusist, not a Christian, but a Jesusist, that he believed in the man Jesus and his ethics but he did not like the trims and trappings of the Anglican church or any other church for that matter, uh, who's particularly anti-Catholic as I recall. Um, but, you know, Cynthia, thank you for sharing that. It, however you 
you know, you bring to Dick, you bring to Dickens who you are and what your experiences are. And um, I'm glad that you were able to see through that and find a deeply humanitarian, secular version of um, the golden rule, if you will, which is expressed in across religious boundaries by other terms than that, but uh, particularly that. Megan, did you have something you wish to say? You're muted. No. Well, thank you. Other other people, what have you have you gotten out of today? What you needed? Tiger, and then Wayne, are you raising your hand or just adjusting your screen? Uh, Tiger, go ahead. Oh, I um, <clears throat> I was resistant to coming today. Um, I'm anti computer, going through a big phase of. I want to live a life, not a, not a screen, not a, not an electronic life. Um, but uh, I know that you are my tribe. You are one of my special tribes, and I need to see you, however I can. So that's how I am here, and I'm um, interested in your your. Um, your viewpoints from your mountaintops. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes left. Uh, before we go, uh, Courtney, would you like to describe what's going to be coming up in the future for the Pickwick Club? So we're going to be taking a break this summer. Um, so we can focus on the universe and you're all invited to, to join us uh, for the Dickens universe, which is going to happen the last week of July, uh, July 26th through the 30th. Um, and uh, we will resume reading another novel together in September. And so I'll be reaching out to everyone um, and we can vote on which which novel to read. Um, I'll send you a list of what we've already uh, discussed and um, I'm always welcome to, to suggestions outside of Dickens or uh, biographies. So um, that's, that's really what's going on with the, with the Pickwick Club. We'll take a little break. Um, we also uh, recently applied to become a uh, Dickens Fellowship um, branch, and uh, we won't know uh, whether we've been um, granted that that branch until later this summer. Um, so I'll let you know what we find out about that. And then um, more about the Dickens universe. So um, like I said, we'll be meeting the last week of July. Um, these are going to be kind of long days, um, starting at nine in the morning and going until about eight at night. Um, lots of different activities. Um, we'll have two panel discussions uh, each day uh, for five days and or I guess for four days and then the last day we'll have some performances. Um, we, um, we host a, a number of different uh, workshops and discussion groups. Um, we'll be uh, doing film screenings. Um, some highlights of the week. Um, we will have, um, let's see, a discussion about lots of adaptations. Uh, one ad adaptation uh, about turning the, the novella into an opera. Um, with a, a screening of, of that opera. Um, also um, adapting the, um, the story for stage for the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, we'll have a, a reading by um, Miriam Margulies um, on Friday, so that's really exciting. Um, and uh, discussions about Christianity and death and um, communities of care and disability in um, the Victorian era. Um, lots of different topics. 
Um, and I hope that you'll you'll join us. It, it'll be fun. You know, if you haven't tend, attended one of the universes and you want to get a flavor for it, I think you could do no worse than to sign up for this virtual version and dip in and out as, as you wish. I want to close today. You've all been great. Thank you so much for bringing a variety of uh, topic, uh, quotes and such but I am going to finish with one of my favorite paragraphs because there is nothing more Dickensian than this. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one last atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't at it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough. And the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onions to the eyebrows. I will leave you with that fabulous image of children buried up to their eyebrows in food. And yet it's not grotesque, it is cel celebratory. And if, Dick, if anyone did that better, I can't think of a writer better than Dickens to have done that. Thank you all for coming today. Please stay in touch with Courtney and the Dickens Project. And if you haven't signed up for Dickens Universe, please do so immediately. Thanks so much, bye-bye. Stay cool. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That was great. Oh, thank you, Peggy. I'm going to hang around for a second in case anybody wants to say something to a smaller group, but not for very long. Okay. Thank or you. put your email. Let let Courtney give us your email if we write. Uh, I am happy to. I am happy to have that uh, that done. Thank you all so much. Thank I you, do, Carl. It's wonderful. I didn't even see some of you who were on page two unless you spoke because I, the, the, my screen is only so big. This is the largest group I've ever facilitated. You've been <laughs> wonderful. And Bruce, I am so with you. Uh, you just have to test every adaptation. And if they don't put in enough quotes, nobody wrote it better than Dickens. So why write something different? It is, it is actually one of the unfortunate things that so many people know the story through the movies because so much of Dickens wonderful language is not in the form of dialogue and so unless there's a voiceover you don't get that in the movies and I think that's unfortunate. I, I, Carl, wanna... yes. I wanted to say something about the Cratchits. Go ahead Glenna. Well I mean I was struck by that none of us brought it up and I guess for me that's the most familiar part of it. I mean, I told you, I unaccountably never read it before, but in all the different adaptations, that's, you know, so memorable. God bless us, everyone. And, um, and now I have to, I mean, you have challenged me to think through why none of us, including myself, and I have, studied as an American historian, the history of domesticity, and why I didn't come up with a passage that you just read is a mystery to me, because what a wonderful evocation of, uh, you know, glorious writing about domesticity. So it's, this was a tremendous day, and you've given me an agenda for thinking. Now. Well, thank you. I, I know you well enough to know that you are a fierce uh, scholar and Dickens lover, I challenge you now to read uh, The Haunted Man, another domestic Christmas book uh, that at least it has a Christmas theme about it. it is, it's not nearly as cloying as The Cricket on the Hearth, and it's, it is similarly structured to A Christmas Carol, but it has its own charms, and rather than being about the power of example, being the moment, the, the, the mode of, of change, it's about the actual function of memory. 
as the uh, mechanism for change. And I, I think you'll like it. Other last minute moments. I have um, just um, would like to tell everybody, if you are joining the universe, make sure you don't miss Robert Patton's discussion. Um, he co-edited the Oxford Handbook with John Jordan. And we were fortunate enough here in Santa Fe, I work with the Institute for Lifelong Learning. He's a friend and he did a four session presentation on the Christmas stories. So he has delved deeply into the Christianity aspect and those sorts of things, but he's entertaining. And I think he's on a panel. I don't know what his exact, but if you pick that up, don't let that be one that you opt out of because it'll be fantastic. So that's it. And I suspect that Tim has several Christmas related items on the auction, which is going to be again, Tim, what time during the universe? Thank you, Carl. We are the closing act of the universe on Friday, the 30th at 3.40 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And yes, everything in the auction is Christmas Carol themed. We will have we will have cool books. We will have figurines. We will have um, tea towels with the Dickens alphabet on it. Um, but we, yeah, we have quite a few really nice oddities. Of course, try to get a real Christmas book, any one of the five. It's a little costly. But we did manage to get a complete set of the Time Life. If you've seen those, uh, they were published about 40, 50 years ago. And they're exact replicas or exact reproductions. So at least we'll have, we'll have a set of those available for you. And I absolutely concur with Tim that the annotated Christmas Carol by uh, the, is it Michael Patrick Hearn, H-E-A-R-N? You are correct. You are uh, correct. Yeah. There was an earlier edition from the 1980s, which I also have, but this one is all new. And one of the things that it contains that came as a bit of surprise to me is that it actually contains um, a reproduction, or I should say a textual reproduction of Dickens's reading script for A Christmas Carol. So yeah. you can actually see what he cut in order to give A Christmas Carol at public readings because he read the whole shebang. Well, he read the shebang that he created out of the original text as one of his most successful readings at the end of his <laughs> career a fascinating uh, part of Dickens's life, if you're not aware of that. He made a ton of money at the very end of his life reading from his own works. Of course, when he first wrote it, Carl, he read it aloud to a group of his friends. It's a, a lovely colored drawing by, uh, I forget which of his artistic friends, but- he, Daniel McLeish. He has a halo behind him, I recall, and you know, men are labeled, and I'm sure Thacker, I, Thackeray was in the room, and he must have been just yeah. apoplectic with jealousy. Um, <laughs> but he turned around and wrote Vanity Fair a couple of years later, a book that Dickens, in all of his genius, never could have written. Thank you all very much. Uh, Bruce, one final comment. And then I we're just have one it. quick question for you, just to see how knowledgeable you, you are. We've been talking about adaptations and we were talking about Cratchit's can you, can you tell me which actor played Bob Cratchit and also played a major role in another classic Christmas movie oh um hmm there are so many so many actors played Bob Cratchit the first one that came to mind was that Jack Cassidy voiced the uh Bob Cratchit in Mr. Magoo's A Christmas Carol, which that came as a real surprise to me when I learned I didn't that. didn't actually know that. I learned something. There's a this whole one, book. There's a whole book. A, this one had a daughter who was also a movie star. <clears throat> oh, oh that, would that be Cyril Richard? No, it would be Jean Lockhart. Okay, uh, excellent. Who, who also played the judge in Miracle on 34th Street. You remember? Put them here. On my counter, remember that scene? 
That's the same person. Bob Cratchit in one movie, the judge in the other. There is an, uh, a book about the animated version of A Christmas Carol, but I think is I'm pretty sure it's out of print. And when I looked it up on Amazon a couple of years ago, it was at a price that was more than I was willing to pay for something that indulged my curiosity. But yes, Maury Amsterdam and Jack Cassidy both supplied voices uh, for uh, Mr. Magoo's A Christmas Carol. And I believe all the songs were recorded in a single day. So take care, everybody. If you're also in also one thing, uh, get your t-shirts for Christmas Carol; they're wonderful. So oh, don't from forget the, from the universe. Yeah, they come in red and green. Oh, beautiful! Great. Thanks okay. so much for that. Yeah. Take care, everybody. I'll see you yeah. at the virtual universe next month. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye.